at every IGF. Normally, it's at the very beginning of the IGF, which is uh, a little bit more helpful for an introductory session. Um, so, uh, I guess with that, uh, we'll get started. Um, so, over here, I will be putting up the terms that we will be uh, trying to define for you. And uh, uh, if there are things that catch your eye, just make a note. And, uh, you know, in the discussion panel, we can go into more detail on anything that you are particularly interested in. So, uh, and, and the three of us will be kind of sharing the news here. Uh, see that I will probably be covering more of the technical, and uh, Sam will be covering more of the political and uh, governance. So we'll start in talking about the domain name system. So you're all probably familiar with domain names. That's the thing on the right-hand side of email address, or uh, in the middle of a URL web address. Um, the domain name server is the computer that's out there on the internet that answers the question about a domain name. So whenever you send a piece of email or go to a website, that email, uh, the, the domain name in that email has to be converted into an IP address, an internet protocol address that the computer understands. This is exactly like in the old days, you open up a paper telephone book, look up a name, and find a number. The domain name system does exactly that. It converts names to numbers or numbers to names so that computers can find things that you know the name of that they need the address of. A recursive resolver is a domain name server that doesn't actually have any answers yet. It's a domain name server that you can ask a question of, and it will go out on your behalf and ask all the other name servers that it needs to ask in order to find out the information that you want, and then it will reply back to you. So, on your computer, if you're configuring your computer, somewhere there's a place where it says IP address and net mask and default gateway and DNS server. Those four pieces of information are what a computer <coughs> needs to be able, any, any device needs to be able to talk on the internet. So the recursive resolver is the DNS server that your phone or your laptop or your desktop computer uses to go get DNS answers from other DNS servers so that your computer doesn't have to do all the work. An authoritative server is one of those big servers out there that knows all about a big domain. Like .com, for instance, has uh, many tens of millions of domains within it. Right, so um, uh, Ford.com is within the .com domain, but uh, you know, so is Philips.com. And so the big authoritative .com main <coughs> servers have to know about every single domain that's inside .com. And so they are, they are sitting there ready to answer as opposed to the recursive servers, which are waiting for you to ask them something so that they can go out and get that answer for you. A root name server is one that knows where .com is, and also knows where .id for Indonesia is, and .in for India, and .us, and .org. It knows about all of the top level domains. So when the recursive server goes out to get information for you. It first goes to the root name server to find an address for .com. Then it goes to the .com name ser server to find an address for Phillips.com. And then it goes to the Phillips.com name server to get www.phillips.com before it comes back to you and gives you the address that you actually want. So it's saving you work. The GTLD is a generic top level domain. A generic top level domain is like .com, .org, .net. Uh, these are domains that are available globally and were set up early in the domain name system formation. CCTLDs are two level, two letter domains that use the ISO country codes and are associated with specific countries. So here in Indonesia, it's .id. In Canada, it's 
Canada, it would call them V.ca. South Africa, V.ca. So these national domains are not owned by the country, but they are associated <coughs> with the country. There is no ownership of internet resources like domain names and internet addresses, but they can be delegated to someone and under someone's control. So some CCTLDs, some country code level domains, are operated by national governments. Some of them are delegated to, say, the communications ministry in the national government, which in turn asks someone in the country to do the work. An IDM is an internationalized domain name. That means a domain name that doesn't use ASCII characters, it uses a different script, script with accents or uh, Arabic script or uh, a uh, uh, Chinese script. So these can be uh, uh, right to left reading instead of left to right. Uh, they can use completely different character sets. Um, the four most recent new GTLDs, new generic level domains, were approved by ICANN just two days ago, all happened to be IDM TLDs. So these were internationalized new generic top level domains. Four new domains, one was in Chinese, one was in uh, Cyrillic Russian. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't remember what the other two were. Uh, in adder.arpa, this is a very techy looking uh, piece of lingo, and in adder.arpa domain is a backwards domain. It's one that you use to find the name associated with the number instead of the number associated with the name. So this is just like a reverse telephone correctly. If you know an IP address and you want to figure out who it belongs to, you can look up the in adder.arpa form of that IP address to find the domain name associated with it. So if you had a log file from your web server, for instance, if you, if you put up a web page and you wanted to know who was visiting your web page, the log file would have the IP addresses, the internet addresses, of the people who had come to visit the web page. You could then turn those into domain names to find out where those people were coming from. Okay, over to you, yeah, <coughs> Okay, thanks, Jim. Now, um, a little bit on the IP addresses and uh, what we're dealing with today. So, we started off by having uh, that defining what's IPv4 addresses, and uh, that is what I think most of us uh, in the internet have been using and until today is still using. Uh, the bad news is uh, a few of the uh, NICs have already ran out of IPv4 addresses. Uh, running out doesn't mean it goes to zero, but basically we are down to the last slash eight block of address. So um, two particular stands out. One is uh, right in Europe, and the other is AP in Asia pack. So both of us are down to the last slash eight, and that is why you also see that we are actively pushing to deploy IPv6 addresses. So by right, if you have IPv6 addresses, you can easily run into Actually, IPv6 addresses, the number is very, very large. It's 2 to the 128 addresses. This is, you know, people trying to find it on energy. Uh, it is far more than there are stars in our galaxy. It is more than there are brains to sit on all beaches in the whole world. People keep trying to find a good way of describing it, but 2 to the 128 is a really large number. It is much larger than 2 to the 32nd, which is how many IPv4 addresses there are. Only four billion. Uh, the slash eights that Sikhat's talking about, that is a block of IP addresses that is four million addresses. Okay, so that gives us a uh, magnitude of what we're dealing with when we go to IPv6. Essentially, everything on the planet can be IP ready and run. Okay, so that leads us to the, the let's to the fourth point about dual stacking. So what happens when you are going from a V4 to V6? Right? So you have two networks and a V4 and V6 to talk to each other. So that's why you see a lot of uh, implementations, for example, when uh, Singapore Internet Exchange started out three years ago, we consciously deploy what we call a dual stack network, 
where if you have a V4 or a V6 ready network, it can just simply connect and it will talk. The two networks will interact with each other so that you don't get anything that is missing in between. Right? So this is the anticipation that everybody eventually will move to IPv6. Uh, the issue of moving is not that simple. Uh, networks can be ready, but uh, the devices that all of us carry in this room, for example, your laptops, your mobile phones, they may not be IPv6 ready. So there still needs to be work to be done at the client side, which is, for example, the Wi-Fi routers you have at home are they P6 ready? The mobile phones you have are they P6 ready? So those things have to be ready before you can access. So therefore, you see a lot of networks today deploying towards that, allowing both V4 and V6 to exist at the same time, so that there is no breakages in internet access. You just break in for a second to, to explain it a different way as well. So IPv4 and IPv6 uh, are two different versions of the internet addressing system. They're exactly the same, except in how large the address space is. So uh, the IPv4 addresses get only 4 billion addresses to the 32nd. That wasn't enough for all the people in the world to be connected to the internet, plus you know, having two phones, a tablet, a, you know, a refrigerator that wants to you know, talk on the internet and so forth. So IPv6, the conversion to IPv6, the larger address space, has already been underway for 15 years. And probably will be for another 15 before we're completely done with the conversion. So that's why dual stack. Dual stack means you're using both IPv4 and IPv6 addresses on the same machine simultaneously. So if you want to talk to something that has an IPv6 address, you use your IPv6 address. If you want to talk to something that has an IPv4 address, you use your IPv4 address. That's dual stack. The problem is to do dual stack, you've got to have an IPv4 address. That means that people who are starting now have a much harder time doing dual stack because they don't have the V4 address. All they've got is the V6 address. So that leads into four to six network address transmission, uh, which, which is when you have a dual stack machine and a, a machine on one side that only has, say, V4, and the machine on the other side that only has V6, the machine that's sitting in between them has both, can translate for them. It can take a packet in using IPv4 on one side and convert it to IPv6 and send it out the other side. The conversion is very easy because everything inside the packet of data is exactly the same. Only the addressing changes. And then when a reply comes back, again, it brings it back in on, on the V6 side, sends it out on the V4 side. That sounds nice and easy and simple, but in fact, because the internet wasn't designed to work with something sitting in the middle, it was designed for everything to talk directly to at one endpoint to talk directly to another endpoint. NATs, network address translation devices, tend to break a lot of software. Right. So um, the next thing, the next area that we want to talk about is routing. Routing is the process of getting data from one place to another place on the internet. So uh, once you've found the thing you want to talk to, uh, now you need to actually talk to it, actually go and get a web page and look at it, for instance. Routing, the, the process of figuring out what route a packet will take across the internet is decided by a whole lot of routers. Routers are the computers that have, well, very specialized computers that have circuits, uh, fiber optic uh, cables coming into them. Many, many circuits coming in some of these routers, and they decide when a packet comes in, which path it will take out in order to get it closer to its destination. These router is like the crossroads uh, between, between some highways, and when you get to that crossroads, you have to decide which outbound direction you're going to take. All of these routers talk to their neighbors in order to form a model of the internet topology so that they know what the shortest path to the destination is. There is no single map of the internet. Every point in the internet has to develop its own map by talking to its neighbors. So Border Gateway Protocol, BGP, is the protocol, the language that's used between routers to develop that map. 
a lot of people talk about BGP because it's the protocol that is used to develop that map. It's the, the sort of key protocol in figuring out the topology and adjacencies in the internet. So this is something that as end users you never have to deal with at all. But it's very key to the internet continuing to function. So if I can add on, um, sometimes you will notice that uh, it takes you a little bit longer to get a, to the same web page compared to say Orbital Book, for example. So this is where the routing protocol is implemented correctly. If there is an application to the nearest point, you will actually automatically route to the next nearest point to pick you that packet of data that you want to collect. So that the internet will still function even though there is a, just a single package. So if you look at the internet as a very big network of networks, a very big mesh networks, multiple points of connections, a one cut in a single point should not cause a failure. Unless, of course, we're talking about massive, you know, um, say a massive destruction of submarine cables connected to Asia, for example, then everything is down. So <laughs> let's say, for example, between Asia and uh, US, the cables get cut, all the cables get cut, the routing will take a longer path. You go from US to Europe to Middle East to Asia, but still it works, right? So that's where the implementation of uh, routing protocols are actually very critical. Yeah, it's it's what keeps the internet up uh, during the constant failures. I mean, nothing is perfect. So uh, these devices and cables, and people are always failing or making mistakes or breaking and having to be repaired. Um, any any huge system is like that, um, but the fact that most of the time most people are still able to talk to each other across the internet is because of the self healing property that BGP uh, uh, BGP remapping of the internet between nodes gives you. Um, so peering and transit are the two kinds of interconnections between networks and the internet. So as you have just said, the internet is the network of networks. It is the aggregate of all of the little networks out there in the world. So if you work in some company, that company has a network. And you know you want to talk to somebody in the university somewhere else, that university has a network. The internet is the set of all of those individual networks. So that's why the internet is written with a capital I instead of the single ship from an internet network, which is any network. Uh, peering is the connection between two large networks that are kind of similar in size. It occurs at no cost, and it only gives each network access to the customers of the other network. Transit is a commercial relationship between two networks where one network pays the other and gets in exchange the guarantee of delivery of packets to anywhere in the world. So if you if you were to draw the internet as a, a hierarchy, the peering relationships are the horizontal relationships between nodes in that tree. And the transit relationships are the vertical ones. So the network doesn't exist unless it has both peering and transit relationships. But transit is the service that's sold, whereas peering is the cost-free interconnection between similar size networks. So this is where the next point we mentioned about internet exchange points, and uh, if you stick to the strictest definition, in the internet exchange point, that is the location where networks actually exchange their traffic or they have peering relationships in the traffic, between their traffic, between uh, equal sizes. Uh, typically, you'll find that content providers, the likes of uh, Microsoft and Google's, will be more than happy to peer with any of the operator networks that have the eyeballs, right? Uh, whereas uh, the, the, the guys that own the eyeballs will actually want to sell something to the content providers. So there's always this tug of war of uh, you know, who needs to more, the eyeballs or the content, right? So in an IXP, it's a place where Networks get to kill each other and exchange traffic. So that's, that's an important consideration. And when we move on to multilateral and bilateral interconnection, uh, essentially we're talking about the way networks will talk to each other. Right? So this ties in with the, the point on route servers. 
So what happens in an internet exchange is typically an internet exchange will run the route server and the members of the exchange will connect to the route server. So that means whenever you're connected to the route server, you actually will establish peering automatically with any other members that are on the same route server. So this will actually achieve the effect of having a multilateral peering arrangement. So it's, a, it's a all to all kind of arrangement. But there will be some operators, like what you have mentioned, the bigger boys, where they just simply want to be selective to do to peer who they want to peer with, and this is where they get to a bilateral relationship, one to one. So they will have a, a more difficult task of establishing a one to one. So it's like I have to talk to ten of you, um, ten separate occasions to establish a one to one connection. Whereas on a multilateral basis, if I connect a rock server, I do it once and I will just automatically talk to anybody else that has come online onto the rock server. So, so actually this, this kind of brings up something that you, you probably haven't noticed, but may give you some insight into the, the economics of the internet. Small internet service providers have a big incentive to connect to as many other networks as they can. And so small networks are more likely to have what's called an open peering policy. That is, they'll peer with anyone who wants to talk to them. And they're also more likely to use multilateral peering in route servers to automatically connect to anyone else who's willing. By contrast, big networks, particularly the big incumbent phone companies, tend to be very restrictive in who they're willing to peer with, who they're willing to exchange traffic with. And so they typically only use bilateral agreements, and they tend to be selective in their peering. They tend to only agree to peer with other networks that are as large as they are or larger. And so what this means is that the little tiny internet service providers tend to grow very, very fast, whereas the big ones tend to stagnate. So big incumbents tend to not offer much faster services and lower prices as time goes on, where the little ones tend to grow very quickly until they become big and market value. Um, so the next, the next thing, hot potato routing and the symmetry of the way things get paid for, we've got some, we've got a little diagram to help explain this. So if you look up here, um, what, uh, I'm sorry. Um, so what you see is that we've got two internet service providers diagram here. One is colored red and the other is colored green, and we have two internet exchange points. The internet exchange points again are the places where the two internet service provider networks interconnect with each other. So you can see that these two ISPs, two internet service providers, have two ways of talking to each other. They can go two ways around uh, this, this path that we need. So the user, which in, in ISP slang is the eyeballs, because the eyeballs are the, the people looking at web pages, wants to get to the content is sitting on a server that's a web page, something like that. So the user sends a query. This is a packet that is requesting information, and they send it to their internet service provider. They're buying transit from their internet service provider. They pay their internet service provider for the service of delivering that query to wherever it needs to go. The user doesn't want to have to care where that server is in the world. So they're paying their internet service provider to take care of that. So uh, here you see a little red arrow showing the progress of that packet from the user to the red ISP. Then the red ISP has a decision to make. You can either send it to this internet exchange point in the west or to the internet exchange point in the east. But the further you send the packet, or the faster you send the packet, the more expensive it is. Speed times distance equals cost. So, the red ISP is always going to do what's called hot potato routing. So hot potato is this children's game where you, you have a stone and you're throwing it from, from kid to kid and you're always trying to get rid of it as quickly as possible. You never want to be the one uh, top holding it. And so hot potato routing means anytime someone gives you a packet, you try to get it out of your network as quickly as you can on the shortest possible path because that's the one that incurs the least cost and it's going to be the highest performance. So the red network is always going to select the exchange point that's nearest to it to hand off the packet to the green network. 
so that the green network receives the packet at the exchange point and brings it into their network. But by definition, that's going to be a longer distance for them. So they get stuck with a higher cost or lower performance to move the packet into their network. And then they deliver it to the server, and whoever's operating that server pays them. You know, they're paying the monthly bill so for the privilege of having packets delivered. Now, the server is going to reply back towards the user. They send the web page up to the green ISP, and the green ISP makes exactly the same decision with the red ISP. So we're always going to send upbound on the shortest possible path. So now the red ISP has to all on inbound, right, at a higher expense or lower performance to get back into their network, and then they deliver it to the user, and the user pays them. So now we've got a complete transaction. The user is requesting the web page, and the web page has come back to the user. So the user is happy, and the people who have the web page are happy. Um, this is called build and keep because the red ISP here has built their user and they kept all the money. That's how the internet works. Phone companies with voice calls use something called settlement. Settlement means that the person who places the call pays a lot of money, and the person who receives the call pays little or nothing. And the phone companies along the way, each one has to pay the next one. So this creates a huge amount of business friction between the phone companies. In the internet, we don't have any of that because the internet service providers don't have to pay each other for procuring rather than using transit. Uh, sorry, at, at the top uh, of any connection, we're always peering, which which has no, no friction. Well, below that, where you're using transit, you have a, a predefined business arrangement that you've already acceded to, and you can go shopping for a different one anytime you want. So the other useful thing about this is we have symmetry. If you draw a dotted line through these two exchange points, the red ISP is building their customer and paying for all of the infrastructure on their half of that, on their side of that line. The green ISP does exactly the same thing on their side. The red and green ISPs never have to come to any business arrangement between each other. They never have to negotiate with the thing. Each one, if they do a good job, is going to be profitable. So now moving on to some security stuff. Security is very topical right now. Everybody is kind of interested because of the NSA stuff and so forth. Um, so really basic security concepts. These are kind of the, the keystones for understanding what people are talking about when they talk about security and cryptography. The first one is confidentiality. You can think of that as like privacy. Confidentiality means that if you are talking to someone else, third parties can't tell what you're saying. Integrity means when you talk to someone else, they can be certain that the message they receive is the same one that you sent. Availability means that you're able to talk to the other person. Someone else can't prevent you from talking to that other person. Authenticity means that when you talk to someone else, they can be certain that you are the person you say you are. It's not someone else pretending to be you. Non-repudiation means that when you talk to someone else, you cannot then deny that you were the person who said it. You can't falsely claim that someone else was pretending to be you. Anonymity means being able to talk to someone else without revealing your identity. So obviously not all of these things are compatible, right? You can't have authenticity and anonymity. Exactly. You kind of can. There, uh, you could speak anonymously with someone on one day, and then come back a year later and speak with the same person again, and they could know that they were speaking to the same person they talked to a year ago, even without knowing who you were. So you can, you can see how these basic terms, basic concepts, can be put together in different ways to, to achieve different goals. A lot of people, for instance, are interested in anonymous payment. They want to be able to purchase things on the internet without revealing their identity, which means that using credit cards is kind of out because the credit card company knows who you are and you have to reveal your name and so forth. 
So, uh, okay, so with security implementation, at the end of the day, there will always be a bunch of threats that will hamper the implementation of a secure network. Uh, the first one is probably the most popular and most often the root problem they have heard of it. Uh, uh, what we call, in short, DDoS, dis Distributed Denial of Service Attacks. So it started off with a simple DOS attack many years ago. And over time, the hackers got smart and said, let's do a distributed attack. So when the DDoS plus the network, it gets really, really terrible. So for example, on our exchange, if any of our members get a DDoS attack, we will call the member up and say, can I pull the plug and take you off the network? That is the only sure way of stopping the problem. Pulling the plug, taking off the network, and then solve it first before you plug in the network. Domain name hijacking, very popular as well, where a company just simply spots on it, or basically just you know, possibly take the domain name that does not belong to them, or simply just keep registering domain names that are getting popular in this part of the world. Hijacking is usually done by forming the plug. So if you own a domain name, that domain name is delegated to you. Uh, someone else might forward the file pending the year in order to get the domain names redelegated to them. Right? So it's kind of like if someone forged a, a transfer of title document saying that they had just bought your house from you. Right? They haven't actually done it, but they created a document that looked authentic and got uh, you know, a new title issue. So domain name hijacking is, is a fairly fairly big problem and um, we've seen a few big instances recently about um, uh, a month ago uh, the New York Times website was hit with a domain name hijacking by the Syrian Electronic Army, which is a Syrian group of hackers. And then uh, just last week, or actually maybe three or four days ago, uh, the whole country of Qatar uh, got taken offline. Every .QA domain got taken offline by, again, the Syrian Electronic Army. They used exactly the same hijacking technique uh, that they had on the New York Times. Okay. Um, so data exfiltration is when someone hacks into your system, they remotely access one of your computers without authorization in order to steal data, to take a copy of data off of your so a spy who wanted to do industrial espionage would hack into a system and steal copies of documents. That's exfiltration. Website defacement is when someone hacks in to your web server and puts up a different web page. So this is much more like vandalism, that's not spying. Uh, identity theft is something that you probably all heard quite a lot about in conjunction with, say, credit card numbers or people uh, taking out bank accounts in your name. Identity theft is, is a big problem on the internet because uh, people are dealing with other people who they can't see face to face and they don't already know. And you're having to disclose a lot of information about yourself to relatively unknown parties when you transact business with them. And often they'll store that data in a database that isn't that well protected. So the internet is, is a fairly dangerous place for identity theft relative to the, the physical world that has some checks and balances. Um, phishing, spear phishing, approaches, these are all things that people can send you an email as an entree into hacking into your systems. Um, a phishing email is one of these emails that you see that uh, says, you know, you just won the, the million dollars, click on this link, right? Or open this attachment. It comes from somebody who you don't know, uh, may have some bogus explanation. And basically, it's trying to get you to take an action that will then compromise your computer in such a way that they can get back into your computer. Spear phishing is the same thing, but where they know who you are specifically, before they start. So they didn't just spam this out to a million people. They were trying to get you specifically. And spear phishing will probably look like it's coming from one of your friends or one of your colleagues. So it's the spear phishing message is tailored specifically to you as an individual to get you to click on that thing. Um, spear phishing, of course, is much, much more rare. It's mostly only used 
uh, by you know intelligence agencies or um, people who are targeting somebody very specific. So really wealthy people get spearfish a lot because there are criminals trying to get the bank accounts of those very wealthy people. Uh, uh, political activists get spearfish a lot by government and intelligence services that are trying to crack into their email to see what they're talking about when they use encrypted email to talk with their friends. Um, spoofing of IP addresses and MAC addresses. Internet protocol addresses are used to reach other things on the internet. But in order for the reply to come back, there has to be a return address. It's just like on an envelope in postal mail. You put the address before you're sending to, but also the address that you're sending from so that somebody can reply back to you. Same thing is true in the internet. Um, if you put a false return address and send something to somebody, and they look at it and say, I don't know what this is, I don't want it, it doesn't seem to be for me, and they send it back, it will now go to the wrong place. It will go to the place, the forged return address, instead of actually sent it from that person actually sent it from. So this is what's used to do DDoS. The distributed denial of service attack often uses what's called a reflection attack. A reflection attack is when you send out a packet that has a return address of a victim. You send that packet to a whole bunch of people, and then each of them sends something back to the victim because they think the victim sent it to them by accident. Um, MAC addresses are sort of underneath an IP address. Um, the MAC address, if you use Wi Fi or you're connected to an Ethernet network, this is the layer two Ethernet address of your computer. It travels with the computer. It's, it's a unique address that's hard coded in your computer or your, your telephone, your cell phone. Um, it's not like your IP address that changes as you move around. When you're on a wireless network, a Wi Fi network, someone can spoof the address of your computer in order to hijack your Wi Fi computer. Why would somebody want to do that? For instance, if you were in a hotel and you paid for that Wi-Fi connection, if you had to pay, you know, six dollars to connect to the internet for the evening, someone could hijack that, and they and you would both be using the connection that you had paid for. Also, if you had opened up, say, a connection to Facebook and you had already authenticated yourself to Facebook, they could use that to hijack your connection to Facebook and already be logged in as you. That's a, a much more complicated kind of attack, but it does occur sometimes. Uh, and the problem is that when you have these complicated attacks, people will often automate them. They'll write a tool that exploits that attack, and then anybody who gets that tool can do the attack, even though otherwise be very difficult. Uh, botnets are zombie computers, uh, they, they birds of zombie computers out there that have been taken over by a bad person who exploited vulnerabilities in the, those computers in order to get control of them. Not because they wanted that computer or data on that computer, but because they wanted to use that computer to attack other computers. So I said reflection attack uh, depends upon unwitting third parties to reflect uh, attack packets back to a victim. A more common way of doing things is using a botnet, where you, where the, the bot master uh, or the bot herder actually controls this huge batch of, of machines that they've already taken over, and they use those machines to send packets directly to victims. Um, a lot of people who run Windows uh, are already botnet. That means their computer has already been included in somebody's botnet without them even knowing about it. So if your computer, when you plug it in to the network, starts sending a lot of traffic to places that uh, you don't think you're actually talking to, it could well be that your machine has become infected. It is being used to attack other machines. Um, obviously, you'd have to have some expertise in order to figure out that that's happening. Um, Last on this list is anomalies. 
thought of us as probably the best known hacker collective. Um, but they're not a collective in the sense of being very important. It's sort of a flag of convenience that anybody can fly if they really want to. Um, you mentioned them up here only because they're, they're the organization of hackers that is best known and shows up in the press now. Um, and they tend to be a, a very loose knit group with a lot of kids at one end of the spectrum who are mostly just having fun and attacking you know, other kids that they don't like or you know, doing pranks. And at the other end of the spectrum is older, more politically motivated people who are doing things uh, you know, specifically to advance some political cause. Um, so the CERTs, Computer Emergency Response Teams, are the agencies, kind of like a police force, that uh, help deal with computer threats, deal with attacks on computers. Um, because all of this is kind of new still, this is not just a function that your police department already knows how to do. So CERTs are specialized agencies often funded by the private sector rather than funded by government. And typically they have a close relationship with law enforcement, but they don't actually have any law enforcement uh, prerogatives themselves. Um, not every country has a CERT, and some places there are industry-specific CERTs over and above whatever may exist for a country. So, for instance, the automotive industry has a CERT globally that Spans in you know, all countries. Uh, likewise, likewise, the aviation industry has a certain of their own. Um, next one, active defense and hacking back. This is uh, a very recent trend. Uh, this is mostly sort of. Do um, you guys remember Blackwater, the, the contractor, uh, the private company in the U.S. that uh, did a lot of military operations? for the US government. Um, this is these kinds of people that are operating in cyberspace. Uh, private companies that want to do kind of military stuff. Um, they argue that if somebody is attacked on the internet, if someone gets hacked, they should have the right to hack back. They should have the right to counter attack whoever attacked them, despite the fact that the first attack was a crime. Right? The, the argument is that a crime is done to you, it should not be a crime to retaliate. Uh, in fact, under law, almost everywhere in the world, it is it is actually a crime to do the same crime to somebody, even if they've done it to you. Um, so this is this is very controversial. Uh, firewalls and access control are devices that can be put in the network, or rules that can be put in the network that are designed to prevent hacking. That prevent certain kinds of patterns or certain kinds of transactions from going through the network. Um, DMZs are, uh, obviously it just refers to demilitarized zone. This is a kind of old concept that still hangs on in enterprise networks, where in your, in your network you have what's inside the firewall, what's behind the firewall that is protected, but you have a separate part that's outside your firewall that's still under your control. And you're supposed to put your outward facing servers in the DMZ. Um, we only mention it because it's a fairly common, uh, fairly common thing. It's, it's just not a best practice. And uh, they're much better and more sophisticated ways of protecting the enterprise servers. Um, so, um, yeah, that's the, the hot topic right now would be privacy. And of course, they need anonymity. And uh, essentially, I think, uh, you know, after the NSA stuff, the anonymous attacks and all that, everybody gets wary of the internet. Um, this is where there are now various uh, options out there available to end users, to enterprises, and all that. They want to just have like, a better uh, safety and precaution when they access the web. Uh, most common ones would be things like anonymous web browsing where you basically browse the web anonymously and uh, nobody knows where you are from. Posted uh, email services, so services like Archmail gives you an email account that you can just simply uh, subscribe to and uh, 
not reasonable. Uh, unless, of course, you know, you know they were uh, so so inert to actually hand over the data. Uh, PGP has been around for a long time with the internet community where you use it to protect your email communications. Uh, it's a little bit tough to use, but uh, it's actually pretty safe because you need both parties to be enabled on that. PGP is pretty good privacy. The name is kind of a joke. It's actually very good privacy. It's an encryption protocol that's used for files of email that doesn't conceal who you're talking to. So you can't use it to communicate with someone anonymously, but everything that you say to them is protected. And PGP uses um, asymmetric public key encryption, this is a kind of encryption, um, and it's most commonly found in email. You can use it to encrypt a file and then, you know, put the file on the server or send it to someone, but mostly it's just used for email. Um, PGP is available on uh, essentially every platform. Um, there, there's, there's no computer that, or, or phone or anything that any of you guys have that you couldn't use PGP on. But again, like any kind of encryption, it's a little tricky to, to use. Um, the, the one downside of using encryption is that although it's private right now, all of these intelligence agencies store everything forever, right? So if they see your encrypted message go by, they'll record it and save it. And 15 years from now, when their computers are much faster, they will go back through all of those encrypted emails from today and decrypt them. And then your dossier will have what you said 15 years ago in it. Um, so none of these systems are perfect, right? You, you gotta always kind of be remembering that regardless of how good the encryption seems right now, it'll seem very trivial for the key to years from now. Tor, the onion router, is the most commonly uh, known circumvention method. Uh, VPNs and proxies are uh, two generic methods of circumvention. Circumvention means if you're sitting on a network that does not have end-to-end -end access to the rest of the network, the rest of the internet, circumvention means going around whatever is preventing you from getting to the rest of the network. So for instance, if you were in mainland China, behind the Great Firewall of China, and you wanted to access a website about Falun Gong, is a religion that is outlawed in China, and you just tried to use your web browser to do it, you would think you would work. But if you use Tor or a VPN or a proxy, it's likely that you can circumvent the Great Firewall of China and actually see the web page comments. So this is how people in a lot of countries that try to maintain strict control of the internet actually wind up using it. And there are many different methods. Uh, you just let me add on. A more, a more real example when you want to use the internet in China, I guess probably more than half of you have a Gmail account. So if you go into China, you actually can't use your Gmail. You can't access your Gmail because they simply bar the access. So before you go in there, it's all VPN, it's all talk, so you can get out and access your Gmail account. Lawful interception versus intelligence. Uh, Lawful interception is the phrase that's used to mean globally what it is the police do. So if the police, acting under law, get permission to do a wiretap, this is what's called lawful interception. If somebody does a wiretap outside of that legal framework, that would be spotted. Right? So most countries reserve for themselves the right to spy, but most countries criminalize other people spying on them. So, you know, countries have kind of fluid definitions of what's okay that very much dependent on perspective. Uh, encryption simply means taking clear text, clear data, data that can be human read, and modifying it in such a way that people just looking at it won't be able to tell what it is. Only someone who has a specific key can get at that data again. There are a bunch of different kinds of encryption, symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, um, public key encryption, which is kind of basement encryption. 
Um, all of these different variants just use different kinds of math and different ways of handling keys. The important thing is that you use encryption that meets your security requirements. And that's something that is sort of beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about uh, in the half hour of change. Backdoors are when you use a piece of software or a piece of hardware that has coded into it a, a way for someone other than you to access it. And unfortunately, many, many devices have these kinds of backdoors coded into them. So if you get a Wi-Fi hotspot from your phone company uh, along with your DSL or cable access, almost certainly it has a backdoor for your phone company to log in and reconfigure it if it gets screwed up. The problem is the phone company is not going to bother to have a secure password on it. They're going to have the same password on all five million of those that they've ever distributed to their customers. And the password is almost certainly going to be admin or password or one, two, three, four. So hackers figure this sort of thing out very, very quickly. So devices kind of appliance devices like hotspots and Ethernet switches and so forth tend to be very easy for, for hackers to get into. They may not have any data stored on them, but they can be used for a lot of other purposes. Um, the last item on this page, um, big data. Big data refers to this notion that there are huge amounts of data about everything that we do that are being generated all the time. And when people store a lot of data about the things that other people are doing, often the law says that they have to anonymize it or they have to protect the PII, personally identifiable information, in those data sets. So, for instance, um, if you go to the grocery store and there's a pharmacy there and you fill a prescription and then you get some medicine, in theory, when you go to check out, there shouldn't be a record saying that. You know, you, with your full name, uh, you know, bought this particular medicine. But in reality, the, the anonymization tends to be very weak because there isn't a lot of incentive to do it well. And so hackers, when they get a hold of these different disparate data sets, often put them together in ways that tell a lot about a person. So this is another really big controversial topic that there are a lot of people talking about here at the ITF and in general, is the problem of big data and privacy and de anonymization and the cross correlation of big data sets. So, the, the last part I just wanted to touch on briefly is where does all these brings us you know, with security, with e and so on and so forth? Uh, essentially, everything we see today is actually over IP. Whether it's a voice call you make to your whole country, uh, surfing that you're doing, the emails you're checking, everything is in hacker. So everything over IP, uh, certainly everyone is familiar with EOIP, right? We've we'll been using all of the sign. Operators are not pushing for that because everything is cheap. Uh, high end, WhatsApp has been the most popular. So, uh, for example, in Singapore, the traffic for WhatsApp actually over to is three what SMS does. And operators today are giving away free SMS, like there's no tomorrow. You know, they basically give you a thousand free SMS. Where last time they're making tons of money over SMS, right? like Twitter, for example. So you get a lot of uh, different kinds of communications that are available now over IP. And all these are actually possible simply because there's a lot of capacity, there's a lot of bandwidth. And when we start moving into things like IPv6 and so on, where you get more and more devices on the network, you essentially are able to go to what we call Internet of Things. So imagine every single glass, every single also every single refrigerator, ovens, so on and so forth, in your home is all internet enabled. Today the first things you see at home that are internet enabled are the TVs, the screens, because that's where advertisers get to you, that's where operators get to you, that's where they hook you up and they hook you on. So then therefore the last thing is with so many things connected, uh, it's a matter of time before the things on the agents and about us being a representative of yourself on the web comes to life. So you know, uh, we could simply uh, get assignments on uh, on agents, for example, to do things, to do meetings on your behalf and all that, simply because everything is internet enabled. 
So that's how we take this approach and move towards. To, to give an example of what we're talking about there, about agents, um, as IPv6 addresses become prevalent, things like refrigerators start to get uh, IP addresses. So for instance, my refrigerator has an IP address, and when its filter needs to be, its water filter needs to be changed, it contacts its manufacturer who sends me an email telling me to change the water filter in my refrigerator. That's a convenience. It's also a little bit of a privacy issue, maybe, but uh, going into the future, um, for instance, in hotels now, there are hotel bar refrigerators in rooms that have little sensors that tell any time you take something out of the refrigerator. It's got a little sensor for each spot of the refrigerator. If you leave a little bottle out, it knows that. And it tells their accounting system what was taken out. Uh, so a, a personal refrigerator might have an RFID uh, wireless reader inside it to so know what products have been put into the refrigerator. And so when you ran out of something and threw it, you know, your milk carton was empty and you threw it away, you would know that there was no longer a milk carton in there. And it could order another milk carton for delivery to you. So this is what we're talking about, the Internet of Things and agents at the time, right? Agent is something, in this case, your refrigerator, that would have access to your bank account in order to buy you milk because it noticed you were out of milk. You can all imagine a million things that could go wrong with this, right? You might be out of milk because you threw it away because you're going on the trip, right? You might not want to curl on your doorstep when you return. But, you know, this is the direction that companies Yeah, 
do is try to figure out how to make themselves relevant in the future. So they have been struggling with the different governance organizations over who should be able to steer the course of the internet. So they're very relevant to everything that, um, that goes on with the internet governance. <coughs> Okay, um, I'll do this quickly so you have time to ask questions. But first, some historical background because it, it helps to understand why we have this real wonderful ecosystem of acronyms um, from the daily technical aspects of the internet. Um, Steve Crocker. He's chair of YCAN, and you know, he was one of the really early planners for the internet. Um, he was there in the pre internet days, pre internet was kind of um, net. And when they were first developing the internet, it was a bunch of graduate students, and they all kind of uh, co opted into this new project, and they kind of all turned up one day to discuss what they were doing. It was like a bunch of students in the classroom waiting for the teacher to come in and tell them what to do. And they realized, oh, I was going to do that, but they're going to have to do it themselves. And so that has very much influenced the way the internet um, has developed. It's a very bottom up process from the people days that the internet was an embryo was the government. Uh, part of that, you know, school kids running the network concept was how do you get information down? How do you discuss what we're going to do? Uh, so this is a story I was told, not actually by Steve Parker, but by someone else, and the story may have changed in between, but the story was that he was staying over at his girlfriend's parents' place. And he had this big idea that he was trying to write documents that were always comments on their works. And he was staying with his parents, so he was back in the late 60s, 70s, early 70s. Um, so he couldn't sleep in his bed, right? So he was sleeping in his bed, and it's not the only way that he kind of writes stuff. So he ended up in the bathroom of his parents' place, writing the first ever request for comment about, hey, how should we develop the internet? How can we organize how we do this? Um, so there's still more requests for comments, but now they're actually kind of like standards for people. I mean, there's two levels of requests for comments. Standards, but they become uh, more formalized and the original concept of a request for is now the internet is right. Okay, try to explain how it went from this, um, as we all know, originally government uh, funded network. Um, originally, uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of John Costell. Internet. Um, in the early days of the internet, it was very important. Uh, so, who the person who wanted to know the address to go to the network? Yeah. She had a pad and pencil, and all of them sent a couple of information to the internet. So, he was like, okay, cool, I'll give you this range of choices. And he wrote a paper. Well, he realized that this hospital was not a very sustainable way of managing the crime. So he developed this concept to begin with, a concept of the IANA, the Internet Asylum Numbers Authority. Um, as the US government realized that this internet thing was actually really successful, they wanted to release it so that it was kind of managed um, by the community and kind of a small government concept. Let's, let's give it out to the public industry. Um, Alongside that, whether it's as the main name's packing, what should we do with this? So um, there was a, a, a committee that was looking at how should we get along with the internet. They came up with a number of recommendations, which was to the ITU as being responsible for the international domain rates. Meanwhile, the US government was not quite sure about the recommendations of the same community. They came up with a concept of what so that's how we ended up doing it. It's a type of young because it was not into the time that I was going to be probably aware that it was a new to the international time. So I think I know. Okay. Um, okay. What are some of the most important ones? Okay. 
One of the, the ways that um, the internet um, so it's kind of manage is network operators. So it's beautiful like that the network operators are going to get fees. Um, they all have common interests. So there are these groups called network operation um, operator groups and bonds. There are there are nodes in many major countries. So there's like Boston, things like in Australia, New Zealand. Um, there's uh, like many of them are regional. So some of the South Asian network operators uh, encompasses I think uh, nine different countries. Jamnog um, is just for Japan, but um,
the open net initiatives we have got on these days, and um, it's uh, it's three organisations that work together to monitor um, and evaluate what's happening in terms of monitoring and seeking us about its own internet. Um, which in recent regulations is very timely. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but since the IETF is starting to be aware that they need to consider the surveillance implications in the future. In terms of business input into how internet technical um, management procedures are developing, uh, there's the ICC uh, basis into a chamber of commerce um, and I don't know the basis terms of the spot, sorry. Uh, but it's a way that business community um, brings information into You are the comers to the internet governance process. I'm not sure how many of you are following the many, many processes in the UN that discuss internet governance. There's the IGF, there's the ITU. Um, they have a currently closed body, it's these member states and I on the council of the Kingdom. Public policy, international public policy, internet issues, something like that. Um, there's a lot of discussion about opening it up to all stakeholders. Um, that we're going to be discussing in the Brazil draft opinion, it's going to be discussed in some of the early sessions. Um, they had a 9.6 group, and at one point, the United States wanted the ITU to manage our locations. Um, I'm sure you can hear from that that we could last year in December. That was the big event in the department uh, for the United States. The international time communications treaties, there's a lot of discussion about the intervention of the internet or not, and the party laws in the end, and the other countries have decided not to sign it because they didn't mention the internet. Um, within the UN itself, there is the General Assembly. Um, within the General Assembly, it has different committees and different issues. The committee one is the security, so anything related to the Cyber security, cyber crime, that may come up in the interview. Um, traditionally, that was the community that would discuss things about the Cold War, but things have moved on, and that's where the cyber security issue can be discussed. Uh, committee 3 is where social, local social and cultural issues are discussed. Um, so, what we do with Committee 3 is a discussion of what's happening in the CNC. CSTD may discuss the laws related to the internet. They will then submit the draft resolutions for the two ECOs, capability and social rights, and all parts of the mass resolutions. And then that particular will lead on to the general assembly committee to discuss this process. And then, of course, there's UNESCO. They're more interested in promoting the issues of the international world.
about your cyber defense, uh, explain about the hacking back mechanism. Uh, Nothing seems right to me as a, a defense because yeah, probably uh, causing a cyber war like that, uh, even though there's a, a statement that the best defense is not offense, but how come a seat assert as you have uh, a cyber defense mechanism like a hacking? Is there any uh, mechanism to defend the uh, country before being uh, hacked? So there are a lot of different actual defense mechanisms, uh, many of them having to do with fireball and access control lists. Um, there are very dynamic ways of creating these attacks that only kick in as the attack is observed. Um, this notion that we can deter attackers by threatening to attack them back. Um, you know, anybody, anybody who is a criminal enough to prevent their mind to think that they can get away with attacking people is probably also going to assume that they can evade the counterattack. And attribution is very, very difficult on the internet. So when someone attacks you, it's very difficult know for certain who it was. This is one of the big problems with this attack back theory, right? It's, it's very easy to do what's called a false flag attack. An attack that looks like it's coming from someone else. So if I secretly didn't like CCAT, I could attack you or make it look like the attack was coming from CCAT. So uh, you would, if you were going to counter attack, you would counter attack him. I would stand over there laughing, right? This is this is just one of many, many problems with this, this hacking back uh, uh, idea. Well, aside from which, it, it is just illegal everywhere, basically, under current law. Um, so, you know, these, these military contractors who want to be able to make money uh, doing offensive operations are lobbying governments all over the place to try and get these exceptions to be allowed to do this kind of vigilante justice. Uh, but it, it's not it's not good for law and order, right? You don't you don't gain law and order by allowing people to have exceptions. Uh, you know, you, you have law and order if everyone has to follow the law. Um, and the business community very much needs law and order on the internet. We need a lower crime rate and a higher rate of trust in order to be able to do that business. There are very interesting questions about what the role of military is in cyber attack and cyber defense. Um, it's very easy for militaries to do offensive operations, offensive operations are cheap. Uh, they are sort of highly rewarded within the structure of the military regime. Um, but defensive operations are very expensive, and there's not a lot of reward for for even success doesn't get rewarded for it. Most of the time, nothing's happening. So, um, so militaries are often very confused about what their role should be. So they just default into some sort of going and having things. This is probably happening in the States because the US military keeps attacking you know, China and Iran and so forth. In Iran, the counter attacks the, uh, so as long as the US military has been attacking Iran, Iran counter attacks on Green Tuesday and Thursday, they attack the banking sector in the US. And so the banking sector is spending many, many tens of millions of dollars on Green Tuesday and every Thursday, and then you can And they complain to the US government saying, hey, you know, cut, cut this out, stop attacking Iran. They're, they're just taking it back out on us. And the military the Chinese, likewise, have uh, 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 cyber military operations, much more aimed at intelligence gathering, but uh, they uh, can uh, 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 be set away. So there are other things in the military operations. Uh, uh, my name is Sarah. I'm from Nigeria. 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 I'm
itu yang orang orang Batak. Sorry ya, gue kan Batak Jakarta. Aku mulai dari orang Batak. Batak Batak. Gue bukannya sekarang mereka tuh baru pertama kali yang kayak keluar kota dan itu juga abang gua abang gua di kampus ada katanya enggak ya yang ini bukan orang eh iya itu abang gua di kampus abang abang iya gua bisa Aku itu sama siapa warnanya sembilan cara itu sama itu sama itu tokoh ya. Kenal anak junior kalian anak BPW si Gloria Maikom. Anak baru ke tiga belas. Itu sepupu. Enggak beneran lah. BPW. BPW dulu ke tiga belas Gloria Maikom. Neneknya dia, neneknya dia jadi ekon, main kom, Gloria ada yang bermain kom. Jakarta juga kan? Dia juga itu tu, ada batak tu, neneknya dia batak, neneknya dari Makassar. Makanya gue mau kalau ada batak yang macam mana ni, baru. Siahan juga. yang sama dia waktu sesuatu waktu sesuatu yang sama dia 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 Tidak kekenyangan, bro, 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 bro. Mas, kasih habis, bro. Bro, habis, bro. Jangan yang berkenyangan dan ada kopetan. Itu kopetannya. Itu kopetan ini. Coba dulu. Hehehe. Thank you.